classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 16, Cluster Expansion. I'm Professor Phillies. We are lecturing from my textbook. And today we're going to discuss Lecture 17, the Grand Canonical Partition Function via the Grand Canonical Ensemble. Okay, in the last lecture we discussed how we might try calculating the canonical partition function for a collection of gas atoms or fluid atoms, particles that interact with each other. And we got at least hints that there were things that would be more convenient if we worked in the grand canonical ensemble rather than the canonical ensemble. And that's sort of like saying it's easier to calculate the pressure of the gas in this room if we leave the door open. But the idea is still there, and we're actually going to carry it out now. And what you're going to see is that there are a whole bunch of power series, and we sit there and invert power series. Uh, the starting point in all this is equation 17.2, and there you have the partition function for the grand canonical ensemble. We demonstrated that psi is e to the beta pv, so there's the pressure of the gas hiding in the exponential. And we can write this as z to the n, and then the partition function for n atoms, and we have to do a sum over all n atoms. We said n is e to the beta p, e to the beta mu, that is z is the fugacity, it's e to the beta mu, where mu is the chemical potential, but now the chemical potential is a supplied quantity, it's like the temperature, it's no longer something that you calculate from q for a given number of gas atoms. After all, the number of gas atoms in the room can be anything it wants between zero and infinity, though as we demonstrated, saturation leads to certain limits on how many gas atoms you can actually fit in this room. So there is there's the grand canonical partition function, and we also um, said, let us go to equation 17.4, which says that the density is z dz of log of psi. And if you, were, if you take psi, equation 17.2, apply the log function to it, and take z d d z, you get equation 17.3. Let me point out how that works. We are taking d d z of a logarithm, so if we take the derivative of a logarithm of a function, we get the function itself in the denominator, and you see that in equation 17.3, it's most of the denominator. And then in the numerator, we actually get d function dz, and if you look hard, that the numerator of equation 17.3 is the described function. That is, the ddz goes into the summation, and it finds a z to the n, and it brings down an n and gives us a z to the n minus 1. But we're multiplying everything by z, and that restores the z to the n to its healthy z to the n state. And so equation 17.3 gives us the density. So that is equation 17.3. So what do we do? Well, we say psi is e to the beta pv. And what we then do is a, ser a chunk of series expansions. And the first is to say that we propose the pressure can be expanded as a power series in Z. Is that reasonable? Well, according to equation 17.2, E to the pressure has a power series in Z. And so it looks as though if we were to take the log of both sides, maybe, maybe, we could get z, uh, the pressure itself as a power series in z. So what we do is we write a power series in z for the pressure, and I've done that in 17.5. And p is, well, kt is kind of reasonable because that's what you want. And then 
If there is a b to the j, those are the those are the variable co those are the coefficients. A z to the j, and I have factored a lambda to the three j into the denominator. Now you may ask, why did I put the lambda to the three j into the denominator? And in a certain sense, is if you do it, the answer is if you do that, the lambdas cancel out in a nice way. So. What do we do? We take the power series for seven in 17.5 and we stuff it in P in 17.2. And then, having done that, we say, oh, that's an exponential in 17.2, isn't it? If I see an exponential, I can do a power series expansion of the exponential. And I will get one plus beta PV plus beta PV squared plus beta pv cube over 3 factorial, etc. Except beta pv is um, the power series in 17.5 times some things. And I get equation 17.6. Now, let me point out a few things on equation 17.6. On the right-hand side of the equation, um, that's the same as the right-hand side of equation 17.2. But what I did is to say I can write the canonical partition function as capital Z, which is the integral over particle positions. The um, integral over all of the momenta in the partition function becomes 1 over lambda to the 3n, and then the partition function has an n factorial. So the n factorial on the right side of 17.6 is the statement that in Q all the particles are indistinguishable. The lambda to the 3n is the thermal wavelength, which we discussed a lecture or two back. And we've just rewritten things. On the left side of the equation, the outer sum is a sum over script L. And script L is the Taylor series expansion summation variable from expanding the exponential as its power series. If you look inside the Taylor, the Taylor series on the left side, at the bottom is the 1 over L factorial. That's the, that's the exponential co um, Taylor series form. And upstairs there is something to the at little l power. And what is that something? Well, it's a v times a beta from 17.2 and a kt from 17.5. They cancel. And then the summation in 17.5 is just reproduced. So we have now reached 17.6. Okay, where is this potentially risky? Well, there are people who are sort of used to the idea, oh, it's a scientific function, it must be smooth, therefore we can take a power series expansion. And these people have two problems. The first is that they're ignorant, and the second problem is that they're dangerous. The issue, of course, is that it's not necessarily true that the thing we're doing the power series in is analytic in that variable. And in fact, if you tried a series expansion like this for an electrolyte solution, you will get some interesting results, some divergent integrals. And the core issue is that the appropriate series, I use the word series in quotes, expansion for an electrolyte solution, has terms in square root of the concentration, and c times the logarithm of the concentration, and other things that should, do not appear in real power series. And if you say it's a real power series, you have sort of assumed the lead terms aren't going to be there and get odd outcomes. We're going to assume the power series exists for things with short-range potentials, which is most things other than electrolytes. Um, Asking when the series is actually convergent is a little more tricky than it sounds. Well, having said that, we get equation 17.6. Okay. Um, 
you might worry, gee, did you leave anything out? Well, there aren't any quantum sums there. I said we have classical particles, and the classical particles um, may have potential energy interactions. After all, they're supposed to be interacting. But we don't have any sums over quantum states. And for simple atoms, which are spheres, well, the low, all of the low-lying states are electronic. Electronic states in elements are way up from ground level. Um, this is equivalent to saying that the gases of most elements are colorless. Can anyone name a counterexample or two? Bromine and iodine. There actually are elements whose gases are not colorless. Chlorine, but that's a diatomic. But most, if you look at um, hydrogen, atomic hydrogen at room temperature or any of the noble gases at room temperature, they're quite colorless. The electronic states are way up there, and for all practical purposes, they do not contribute to the partition function. If you were doing this for real molecular compounds, you had better worry about the question a bit. Okay, we are now going to use 17.6, and we will solve for the little b's as functions of capital Z. The actual work is homework, but there is a basic principle, and basic principles, how do we do this? And the answer on how we do this is we apply a rule which is shown as equation 17.7. And what 17.7 does is to discuss what conditions are required if you want two power series to be equal to each other. And so we write the two power series as shown, powers, two power series in X with two sets of coefficients, A and B. In order for there to be an equality there, there are two requirements. The first requirement is that the series have to be convergent. If the series aren't convergent, it's meaningless to ask anything else. The second statement is that if the series are convergent, little a must be equal to little b. That is, there's no way to write the two series if they're convergent with two different sets, a's not equal to b's, and the series are equal to each other. Trivial proof. For a sub n, take the nth derivative of the series with respect to x. If you do that, x to the n becomes 1, yes, on both sides. All of the lower terms disappear because they were constants and their derivative was taken. And ask what happens at x equals 0. And at x equals 0, all of the terms above n vanish because they contain x to the i minus n for i minus n some positive integer, and therefore at x equals 0, they vanish. And therefore, the two series must be equal term by term. Okay, so having said that, we are now going to write the little b's in terms of the configuration integrals, capital Z. And equations 17.8, 17.9, and 17.10 actually do this. And since I'm not sure you believe me or not, that's one of the assigned homework problems. You're going to do all 12 homework problems for the chapter. But as I said before we turned on the camera, they really are crank turners. In fact, they're crank turners that you can do using computer algebra. Okay, so in any event, there are the little b's in terms of the z's. Well, that's fine, except there's a little problem here. Namely, little z isn't usually what's conveniently experimentally accessible. What is usually accessible are not the fugacities of Z, but the densities N over V of the gas. That is, if I want to know pressure versus something, 
I somehow am clever and put a weight amount of some gas into the container and measure the pressure. Uh, weighing the gas requires some cleverness. There are several alternatives here if you think about it. But the net result is that um, you'd really like pressure in terms of density, not fugacity. Okay, so how could we do this? Well, you can try a direct approach. We're going to do something indirect. Uh, we're going to take a, try to find a power series for z in terms of rho. That is, we're going to try a power series that will give us the fugacity in terms of the density. And once we have z in terms of rho, we can go back to equation 17.5 which is pressure in terms of z. We plug in the power series for z in terms of rho. We collect terms and we end up for a power series in the density. We do end up with a power series in the density and we just have to do this, find the series, plug it in, collect the terms. And if this feels very familiar, by the time you're doing it, it's because you will have just done it in equa to find equations 17.8 through 17.10. The target is equation 17.11, which is the pressure in terms of the density. You see an, an average over V, that's the density. The capital Bs are the virial coefficients. Now, if you think a bit and have, were in the right place at the right time, you have encountered the word, well, some of you have encountered the word virial before. It's the virial of Clusius, and it's a classical mechanics technique. If you haven't encountered it, well, they're actually the same thing. And one, an alternative way of deriving the ideal gas law is, in fact, to use uh, the virial of Clusius, and if you hunt long enough, you can find someone who will do this for you. There, is, there are a few sources out there to do it. Okay, so what do we do? We go back to equation 17.4, which says the density is this derivative of log of psi. Yes? However, if you look at 17.2, psi is e to the beta pv, right? And therefore, the density rho is d dz of log of psi, so it's d dz of beta pv. Yes? So there is the density, and you can plug in, and you can get um, p into there. And then you have an expression for p, remember, in terms of z. You just derived it. You derived equation 17.5. Okay. Well, having said this, um, since we have the density, we can write the density in terms of psi. We can write the density in terms of the pressure. And if we actually do that, we get equation 17.12. Uh, the little j on the right side of 17.12, you notice it's a j, b sub j, z to the j. The j is there because we took the pressure in terms of z. We took d dz, which d dz of z to the j brings down a j, and we multiplied by z and got the series back. And we now have density in terms of z. Well, how do we invert this? Uh, one year I was discussing this and one of the grad students immediately said, oh, that's easy, you use the Borel theorem. And he's completely right. Uh, we're going to use something a little more concrete, that is, we're going to guess that if you can write density as a power series in z, it must also be possible to write z as a power series in the density, and that's equation 17.13. See 17.13? Mm -hmm. um, well, what we will do is to take 17.13 and plug it into 17.12. 
And when we do that, on the left side of the equation, we have density rho, because we haven't done anything to that. And on the right side, we have this very complicated polynomial, which is, has some b sub j's and some a's, and density to all sorts of powers. Yes? Well, once we've done that, we have something that looks sort of like 17.14. So we have density is a power series, and density will... That one's supposed... That one's a gift. Uh, density is a power series, and density is true if W superscript 1, the coefficient of z to the first, is 1, and if all of the other capital W's are 0. Okay. So knowing that that's true, we can solve for the A's in terms of the B's, and we end up 17.15 is just we put everything in, and you get this equation of relating the B, containing the B's and the A's and density to various power, and on the left side you just have density to the first. And now we equate coefficients. And the trick in equating coefficients is that um, since the left side as a polynomial in a row just has a sub 1 equal 1 and all of the other coefficients are 0, the variable itself is a polynomial. It's just a very dull polynomial. Um, you can discover all of the a's or b's are related. Um, each new power in the density gives you an additional a. And so if you equate everything and solve, you can compute the little a's in terms of the little b's. And I have a note to myself that maybe there is a typographic error in 17.18. But I haven't checked that. But you're going to derive the a's in terms of the little b's anyhow, because you're going to derive these. And it's all straightforward algebra. Okay, since we have the a's in terms of the little b's, um, we can now do the following. We can now write what you see in 17.19. What have we done? Well, we said z is some power series in a to the rho. That was equation 17.13. Take a look at equation 17.13. Yes? Okay, well, by going through 1718, we solved for all of the little a's in terms of the little b's. And therefore, in 1719, I can write z as a function of density. Isn't that nice? Okay, now I have a power series expansion for the little z's, in, for little z in terms of density. Now I go back to 17.5, because in 17.5, I have the pressure in terms of z. Check. So let us take z from 17.19, it's a power series in density, and plug it into 17.5. What is going to happen? Well, I get a power series for pressure in terms of density, don't I? Of course, I now have to rearrange and collect terms again. Sound familiar? And when I am done with this, I have a power series for the pressure in terms of the density. To be precise, I have equations 1720 through 17.22. Yes? And one of my little notes to myself says that in 17.22 there appears to be a typo uh, because there is a z3, I'm reading across the first line, minus 3 z2 z1 plus, and it says 3 open parenthesis z1 cubed. Uh, my little note to myself says it appears that the 3 should be a 2. And you should check if the typo was there or not. 
The capital B are the virial coefficients. The capital B give the pressure of a gas in terms of its density if the gas molecules interact with each other. Isn't that nice? And so you do these configuration integrals and you can get the pressure in terms of the density. Uh, you can make some further progress if you rewrite the capital Z's in terms of the Mayer F functions, F, I, J. We'll get to that. Uh, but meanwhile, there's sort of a trick. And the trick is as follows. It's section 17.3, graphical notation. Uh, the idea in graphical notation is that we have these integrals like Z3. And Z3 is integral dr1, dr2, dr3, e to the minus beta u, where u is a sum of the three terms. Well, that's nice, but if you remember, you remember we introduced the Mayer F symbols? F is e to the minus beta u minus 1. That tends to say we can replace the z's, go into the z's and replace what's in the integral with, with Mayer F functions. And that turns out to be quite useful. But the first thing we do is to introduce some graphical notation. And the graphical notation is as follows. We have something called graphs. And a, graphs, a graph is um, a collection of circles and lines. The circles represent atomic coordinates over which we're integrating. Uh, the lines represent there is a Mayer F function linking these two. So that if we have an integral dr1, dr2, f12, uh, that's the first line of 17.23. That's the same as two circles linked by a line. There is one complication. Well, it's not a complication. It's a simplification. All of the f's depend on only the separation between two atoms. Check. Therefore, we can do a change of coordinates in which the first variable is the position of the first atom and the other n minus 1 variables, vector variables, are the positions of atoms 2 through n with respect to atom 1. The f's only depend on interatomic distances so if you grab the cluster and you translate the whole cluster in space its value does not change. And therefore, the integral on dr1 is an integral over a constant, and it's just the volume of the system. And so that's why we have a v. Ditto in the second line of equation 17.23. We have an integral over four atomic positions. And it's an integral over a listed product of the f's. But if you draw out the product of the f's, well, there's an f1, 2. So I have atom 1, the line, and the line reaches atom 2. And then I have f2, 3, f3, 4, f2, 4. So from atom 2, there's a line to atom 3. From atom 2, there's a line to atom 4. And then there's a line connecting atoms 3 and 4. And that's exactly what you see in 17.23. OK. A more complicated graph is shown in 17.24. Yes? Now, 17.24 also shows you, or shows you the opposite of a standard calculating error the first time you, you see one of these. Um, the variables of integration were originally the position of atoms 1 through 5. Yes? 
and we can replace that with atom 1 coordinate and then the coordinates for atoms 2, 3, 4, 5 relative to atom 1. And when we do that we have we started with an integral over the position of five atoms. We end with the integral over the position of five atoms. The textbook error is as follows. If you look at that list of F's on the bottom line of 17.24, in addition to the F12, F13, F14, there's also, for example, the last character in F sub 3, 5. That's the Mayer symbol linking 3 and 5. Check. See mm -hmm. it? Mayer symbol linking 3 and 5. There is no variable dr35 there. The reason there's no variable dr35 there is that the distance between atoms 3 and 5 is not independent. Once I've told you where atoms 3 and 5 are relative to atom 1, that's the integral dr13 and the integral dr15. Once I've told you where 3 and 5 are relative to 1, I've also told you where they are relative to each other. And so you want to be careful that when you start setting these cluster integrals up, you don't put in extra integrations dr that are incorrect. Okay. Now we talk about writing the capital Z's, the configuration integrals, as graphs. And to do that, there are two steps. We start out with the Z, which is an integral over position of e to the minus beta u. The first step is to replace e to the minus beta u with f. Then we expand all of the f's and collect terms. And then we replace the integrals over the f's with the graph symbols. So let's actually do that. And we start with 17.25. And the z1 is the configuration integral for one gas atom. Well, this is kind of trivial, because if there's one gas atom, there are no interatomic potentials. And therefore, the Z1 is just the integral of dr1 times 1, which is the volume of the system. Now we push ahead to dr Z2. Next line. Z2 is the integral over the positions of atoms 1 and 2 of e to the minus beta u12, v12, I call it. And if you look at the top line of 17.26, there are the two integrals, and I've chosen, rewritten the coordinates, and I've taken e to the minus beta v and rewritten it as e to the minus beta v minus 1 plus 1. Yes. Well, e to the minus beta v12 minus 1 is f12, and the 1 is, hangs around by itself, but I can now do the integrals. Well, I can do some of the integrals. The integral on dr1 just gives me a v, because nothing inside it depends on where atom 1 is. Then the integral, there's an integral of, over e to the minus beta v minus 1. That's an integral over f12. And then there's an integral dr12 times 1. And that, again, is the volume of the system. So you end up with the diagrammatic form, g, look at 17.26. There's a v. There's an integral dr f12. And that gives me the simplest um, graph, two dots linked by a line, plus a v. Okay. Now we repeat this for Z3. Well, Z3 has an e to the minus beta v, v12 plus v23 plus v13. There are three atoms, so there are three potential energies. We replace e to, each e to the minus beta v with f plus 1. Yes? 
So we now, instead of a product of 3 e to the minus beta v's, have a product of 3 f plus 1's. We expand out all of the f plus 1's, yes, and we separate terms, and we get 17.27. Check. And now we write, rewrite 17.27 as graphs, and we get 17.28. In doing that, I have done something legal that I haven't emphasized yet. Uh, for example, in this, there is expansion of f's. There is second line of 17.27. There is an f12 and an f13 and an f23. Yes? And you're going to do those integrals. But all of the pairs of atoms are separated by the same potential energy. This is a one component system. And therefore, whatever f12 is, it's equal to f13 and to f23. Right? And therefore, the sum of those three f's is just three times any one of them. Ditto f12, f23, and f13, f23. The integral over the product of two f's is the same no matter which pair of connected f's there are. And so you get one of the other terms in 17.28, the 3v times the three dots in a triangle connected by two lines. And so you end up with 17.28. Yes? Okay, so we've now got the z's in terms of the graphs. We also, end of the last section, have the z's in terms of the capital B's. See it? So what we do is we take the graphical expression for the z's, we plug them all into 17.22, and we collect all the simplifications we can. And when we do, we will end up with an expression for the capital B's in terms of graphs. Of course, what we have to do to some extent is to hope that when we do that, life becomes simpler rather than messy. But you would correctly guess we would not have dragged through all of these series and this horrendous piece of homework that we're about to do if there were not a good reason for it. So we do that. Well, Z1 is kind of, the B1 is just 1. That one was easy. B2 is Z2 minus Z1 squared. And so I have written on 17.29 what um, B2 looks like. Yes? Well, there's a minus 1 over 2V, V, and you see the expansion there, yes? And you notice there is a, a plus v square and a minus v square in the middle piece of the equation. And those cancel. And when you're done canceling everything, you get for b sub 2 the right side of equation 17.9. That is, you end up with a single graph. Well, that's, at least sim that's a little simpler than z2 minus z1 square. Now we go to 17.22, and 17.22 is B in terms of, well, actually, if you go through that, there are five terms, one of which is the square of a, of a binomial. There are a whole pile of terms for capital B in terms of the Z's. And I have written that out in, in 1730. There's cancellations. One of them is a little more subtle and is shown in 17.31. And 17.31 deals with the black, the three points in a triangle and two lines connecting two of them. 
And what I demonstrate is that while well, those things look like the bottom pa of page 245, if you look hard at the math, you realize integral dr12, dr13, f12, f13 is separable. It's separable because the two f's separately depend on these two independent variables. And therefore, as shown in 17.31, the triangle is the same as the square of two lines, two dots linked by a line. And so in um, 1730, you can replace the triangle using 17.31. You then cancel everything and ask what you get. And what you get is equation 17.32, which says that B3 is one diagram. Isn't that nice? B3 really simplifies. Now you might start hoping, does this mean we always end up with one diagram? Not quite. B4 is given by 17.33. And you just turn the crank, and if you're careful, out comes 17.33. And it only, you start with a lots of diagrams, and you only end up with three of them. And therefore, to do B4, you only need three separate integrals. Well, you can keep doing this simplification. Uh, you get a very large amount of simplification but you do not get total simplification. That is, when you are done simplifying, you st still end up with a certain number of diagrams. Uh, you might ask, gee, which integrals do we get? Well, each of those diagrams represents an integral over some number of variables. And if you look at all of those diagrams, the ones that are left all have the feature that if I reach in and delete any one point, all of the other points are still co connected to each other. Well, B1, no points, and B2, two points, you have to define as being this. But all the rest, like the triangle, if I de delete any point in the triangle, the other two dots are still connected. And in fact, there is a general proof that all of the singly connected graphs, the graphs that disconnect when you suppress a point, all those graphs disappear. And what are left are the doubly connected graphs. Uh, after a piece, there are still a whole lot of them. And one thing you might wonder is, gee, is there some clever way to rearrange things again so you end up with fewer graphs than you had before? All I can tell you is that no one has ever done this. Okay, I give you examples in figures 17, 1, 2, and 3 of singly and doubly connected graphs. The graphs at the bottom of page 246 are singly connected because if you delete the atom I indicated, they're disconnected. 17.2 shows special case graphs which we define to be doubly connected. And then I show you some graphs of things which are unambiguously doubly connected. Well, having said that, we can now write the pressure in terms of the potentials in, as seen in 17.34. And 17.34 is much simpler than what we started with. It is a power series in the density which should be called rho consistently. There's a rho naught at the right of the top line, which should be rho. In fact, rho naught should actually be, if you look at that hard, that should actually be rho squared. Uh, but we've certainly got now a power series for P. Okay, so we, have, we set out to find a power series for the pressure in terms of the density for interacting particles. And if you look at 17.34, we have done so. 
Is this the simplest power series? Well, it's the simplest one that anyone knows. What you are going to do now for your homework is problems 1 through 12, most of which are the, just these series rearrangements. Uh, the only one that is perhaps a little more dramatic is 17.35, because if you think a moment, we actually did not reach our destination yet. Go back to equation 17.2. And the question was whether we could write, how we can write 17.2 for the grand canonical partition function as a power series in the density. Well, to do that, you take our power series for the pressure, you stuff it into 17.2. Clearly, you're going to need some power series expansion of the exponential again. And you now collect terms, and you will get chi in terms of the density, I think. Alternatively, you could say that someplace back in here, I have an equation for z in terms of the density. It's 17.13. And since I have z in terms of the density and know what the a's are, I might be able to plug that into 17.2 and get chi in terms of the density. However, that is today's lecture. You have a week for those homework.